Right now on Movie Review Talk, Roma is finally here, is the favorite, our favorite, and a brand new movie from the Coen Brothers. Hey there, movie fans. Welcome back to Movie Review Talk. I'm your host, Scott Movie Mance. Right here on Collider, every week we review the new movies. We pick a Blu-ray for something you might have missed, and we pick movies to stream, and there are a whole lot of them these days, some of them actually worth seeing. <laughs> and here's the beauty of it. This is a spoiler-free show. We do not give any spoilers away. All right, okay, I fess. I fess up. Sometimes I let a spoiler go, but it's never anything For bad. Shame. It's yeah. never anything bad. Like, I would never say, oh, Charlton Heston is on Earth the entire time. I would never say, Rosebud is a sled. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but sometimes, you know, something slips through. But every week, here's the beauty. I love doing the show because not only do I get to talk movies, but I get to talk them with friends and fellow critics and movie. Movie, movie experts that I really love and respect and I've known for many, many years, and this week is no exception. Joining me once again, returning for her second engagement here on Movie Review Talk, she is the president of the LA Film Critics Association. She is a contributing critic for National Public Radio and, and, she is the recipient of the Press Award from the Publicist Guild. Oh. Remember that? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Claudia Puig, thank you so much for coming back My here pleasure. on Review Talk. So happy to be here. It is always great to have you here. Thank you. Lots to talk about today. And here's something else. So this guy, yes. this guy flew right out here. He flew here from New York City. From New York. Just <laughs> to be here on Movie Review Talk. Just wow. to be here. And also, you know, to do the premiere for Mary Poppins yes. Returns, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yes. You know, but, but, <laughs> Review Talk was the priority. Eric Davis, he is the managing <clears throat> editor for so Fandango. Excited. Very, very exciting. You know, we talk movies all the time, yeah. but now we get to talk, to the, talk about them in an official capacity. Yeah, you know, I like to bring a little New York flavor out. I love it. I can hear it right <laughs> now. I hear the New York. You know, I'm actually from a suburb of New York called Philadelphia. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's only two hours away. <laughs> well, let's get right to it. The first movie we are reviewing today is The Favorite. I saw this movie back in Telluride. It is directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, the director of The Lobster and Killing of a Sacred Deer. Interesting film. Uh, the cast is Emma Stone, Rachel Weisz, and Olivia Coleman. It's the 18th century, and the Queen of England is frail. Her close friend, Lady Sarah, is pulling the strings. And then a conniving new servant arrives on the scene to really shake things up. Claudia is the favorite your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> it is not my absolute favorite, but it is one of my favorites. Yes. Um, I, I really, I have a mixed feeling about Yorgos Lanthimos, but I loved The Lobster. <laughs> um, I, there's some of Dog Tooth I wasn't as extremely crazy about, but this is easily his most accessible film. Um, for he, him. <laughs> for him, yes. <laughs> Others might not find it as accessible, but for him it is definitely accessible. Um, the performances are amazing. Mm -hmm. The three women, it, it belongs to them. There's some good male performances as well, but it belongs to Olivia Coleman, Rachel uh, Weisz, and Emma Stone, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's really visually gorgeous, too. I, first time I saw it, I've seen it twice now. The first time I saw it, I was really caught up in sort of the clever dialogue and the machinations of the intrigue. And then I watched it again and just looked at the gorgeous the kind of fisheye lens and then the beautiful production design and the music, which is amazing. I mean, it, it fires on all cylinders. It's, it really does. It's really beautiful, and it's quirky and weird and offbeat and nothing that you would expect happens. It's all completely unexpected, which as critics we love because we're so used to things following a certain playbook and this definitely does not. In, in, in all the right ways. In all does. the right ways and Eric very Davis. clever writing. Yeah, no, I echo a lot of those sentiments. It's a performance movie and you know, it, and tone. I, we're, we're talking about a couple of films today that sort of uh, mix these different tones of dark comedy and humor and drama and sadness, you know, I think the Coen brothers are so good at yeah. this and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and Yorgos is so good at this. And I think he's really sort of with the lobster and now this kind of uh, showing you really how you can, the complexities of delivering a story and how you can make something super funny and then super sad and, and 
gut wrenching and disgusting. And, you know, so much of those emotions are in this film. And it's anchored, of course, by these three women uh, who deliver, I think, three of the year's best performances all in yeah. one yeah, film. How do you yeah. decide which one's going to be an award? I nominee? can't. They're all great. And this yeah. is yeah. I've been doing predictions right now. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be Emma Stone. And I was like, no, it's Olivia Colman. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you're like, well, yeah. Rachel Weiss is so great. Why not all three, mister? <laughs> yeah. No. But I mean, just the chess games that they play with each other, you know, the script with your, which Yogos did not write, right. uh, which I think helps in this case. Yes, it does. Um, it brings it, a little bit more clarity. It to does. It. And the yeah. language is, is terrific. It's got, you know, the political intrigue. It's it, What I liked about it is that I'm not such a big period piece fan. I'm mm -hmm. not the guy that's, that's running out. You're not a masterpiece theater guy. No, I'm not yeah. saying I have to go <laughs> see. They're wearing the wigs right. and the crazy makeup. <laughs> uh, that's that's going to be a movie I'm going to go see. But, you know, this one, I think uh, it's very accessible. Yes. It's very different. It's unlike any movie really that we see in this kind of period in yeah. this time period well, it's uh, and contemporary so, yeah. in dialogue sometimes too I mean it's anachronistic where the, the dance scene the dance scene yeah. is, is, is terrific <laughs> yeah it really you know? is and, ju and, just, and just some of the lines you know let's shoot something yeah you know, <laughs> you know this movie is wicked fun it is it's wicked fun which is not a movie that I would ever say about a Victorian era period right. yeah exactly <laughs> um, you know I'm, I'm kind of with you uh, you know the period piece type of movies oh are, see are not, I'm, I'm of course a sucker for them yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It's not, not, not usually my cup of tea but yeah. you know I always would say I always say embrace your taste having said that this movie has so many great merits that it defies its setting and I see it as a Victorian era all about Eve mm. because of the way that these three women it is it's sort of a yeah. love triangle well it is a love triangle but you know a love hate uh, triangle uh, Emma, <laughs> yeah and Emma Stone's uh, character arrives on the scene to really shake things up with Rachel Weisz and Olivia Coleman. they are all three absolutely worthy of, of nominations and this is a film that when we saw it at Telluride Claudia uh, I, I really liked it a lot there but I was able to embrace it a lot more the second time me around me too me too yeah, yeah I, don't, I think it maybe requires that because it it is it's dense with really interesting you know witticisms and the you know the the it goes in such a way that we are not expecting it to go and watching the performances the nuances of the performances i just think it's oh it's it, it's really something and i think in in a sort of the opposite of embracing your favorite kinds of genres i think there's a good movie in every genre and you know you, you say you know, people will say well i don't like this kind of movie you know, this is a perfect example. This is yes. a costume drama, but it's like a costume drama on acid or something. Exactly. I mean, yeah, on steroids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always said it was on steroids. But, but I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, the performances are great. The screenplay is great. Yes. The cinematography is great. It looks like Beautiful. Yorgos used a lot of natural light. Yes. And uh, like what you said about, about this being his most accessible film, uh, you know, when you look at The Lobster, I love The Lobster. I, I mean, Killing with Sacred Deer. I can't say I love the film, mm -hmm. but it was effective. It right. was unnerving and disturbing and uh, mesmerizing. Uh, this one is more accessible because it has a lot of a lot of humor. But just as mesmerizing. Uh, just as mesmerizing, and you know, for for different reasons. And I I think it definitely. Uh, worthy of being on my list for one of the top five best movies of the year. And again, I felt that way after I saw it the second time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I feel like certain films that that you like just sort of like need to, once you know what to accept, expect, you can see it again and appreciate the things that you might have not really been prepared for the first time around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of the films that sort of are percolating to the top of the best picture contenders and potential this year are the sort of films that you really do need to watch multiple times. Yeah, they're yeah. so layered and they're so dense and rich with themes and characters. You need to and process them a little bit. You really bit. need yeah. to try, especially this one. There are so many games that are yeah. being played yeah. between yeah. the men and the women and the women and the women. Uh, <laughs> and there's just so many tiny little moments in this film uh, that are just spectacular. The yeah. other thing about this movie, it's one of three movies this fall being released by Fox Searchlight. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last 10 years, since 2008, four of the, of the 10 movies to win the Oscar for Best Picture, four of them went to Fox Searchlight movies. I would not rule out a fifth because there's really no surefire one front runner like a Titanic or a Return of yeah. the King or even like an Argo that everyone's saying, oh my God, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. There are like four or five movies that could easily, deservingly win the Oscar for Best Picture. Three of them we're going to be talking about today. I know, it's amazing. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm laughing at the idea of a Yorgos Lanthimos film being 
Best yeah. Picture. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I, just, just the fact, if yeah. this movie actually won Best Picture and was in that list. It, it would be like mind-boggling. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, picture, director, screenplay, the, the three actors, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, definitely cinematography, costume design. There's like a whole lot that it could get nominated oh, for, yeah. deservedly so. Oh, yeah. sure. Letter grade, Claudia. Um, A minus. Yeah, A minus for me. Eric? Yeah, A minus. A minus. Okay, yeah, A same. minus. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I love the favorite. And again, you know, this is a film. Like when I first saw it, I originally felt like, you know, I don't know if this is going to like. You know, it's, it didn't seem like a movie that like everyone would see. You know, rush out to see. You know, it's not that kind of a movie. But I think that is a movie that that it had the highest per theater average opening weekend for a, a limited release of any movie in 2018. And I just hope that that transfers as it does expand wide because I think there there's a lot to, it's like a Spiel, uh, not Spielberg, a Kubrick movie mm -hmm. in the sense that you know you, you need to sort of see it a couple of times to really absorb it and embrace it. Just like the next film we are gonna get to, this one, Man, we've been hearing about this movie getting accolades. It's been talked about for months since Venice, Telluride, and Toronto. And now it is finally here in select theaters on Netflix starting December 14th. This is Roma. This film is written and directed by Alfonso Cuaron. The star of this film, first-time actor Yalitza Aparicio. And the year, it's a year in the life of a fractured middle-class family in Mexico City in early 1970s and the diligent service servant who works for them. Uh, wow, Eric. Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is like a, from, from one best picture contender to another best picture contender to a film that I think uh, without the Netflix component, mm -hmm. uh, which I think to, is is still a bit controversial when it comes to voters, I think this is the movie that deserves the best picture. Wow. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think absolutely. it is just sensational, yeah. and it's so fascinating to see Alfonso Cuarón go from Gravity, yeah. uh, which is in <laughs> outer space, and his next movie is like the most grounded movie uh, on Earth. I think what's so fantastic is that uh, you know, there aren't a lot of movies that you can go see where you just don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. just unfamiliar, and all the faces are unfamiliar, and it really allows you to sort of get swept away uh, into the lives of this family. Um, and sort of, uh, you know, it's it's very personal. You can tell Certainly. that it's based on his life and his parents' divorce. And I think there's so much of this movie uh, that is just gorgeous to watch. And it yes. did take me. It takes took me probably about 20 minutes to kind of sink in yeah. and feel it. But then it's one of those films that all of a sudden you're like, okay. And then you're just in it. You and know, then you're in it and you're crying. There's a and magic. Then you're just sitting there at the end, like, mm -hmm. holy crap! Mm -hmm. What this out. movie just yeah. did to yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, we sat which next is to each so other. Yes, we did. I tell you right. Right. Watch as I was dying to see this movie. I'm a huge Alfonso Cuarón fan. Mm -hmm. Going back to well, his earliest stuff, Mamá también, and Little Princess mm -hmm. before Prisoner of Azkaban, Children of Men. I mean, all of Children it. Children of Men's great. He's yeah. just <laughs> he's perfect. He's an amazing filmmaker, and this film is easily the best film I've seen this year. Maybe the best, one of the best films I've ever seen in my life. Wow. I mean, it's Claudia. so Claudia. groundbreaking. I know. <laughs> seriously, seriously. I have, I've seen it now four times, oh, I think. Okay. I could yeah. easily say it another four. Mm -hmm. I just feel like it, I, I was submerged into their lives. Yeah. And yes, 65 millimeter, gorgeous, black and white. Mm -hmm. The sound design that's so immersive, the same sound design that he used for Gravity, but for this intimate story mm -hmm. so that you're completely you know, enveloped by it. Um, and as you say, the, the faces that we don't know, so they feel like real, you know, people. Um, I'm also, I, I lived in Mexico City in the late 70s, so I knew this early 70s Mexico that he talks about. I have relatives that live in Colonia Roma, which is where, so I have a lot of personal kind of connections to this film, but just looking at it as, as a viewer, I didn't know where it was going, mm -hmm. but I was so caught up in their lives and just, I felt their emotions so deeply. I think Yalitza Aparicio is amazing. Yeah, I is. mean, she's never acted before. The only, the, the, actually the only professional actor in the film was a woman who played the mother, Marina de Tavira. Everybody mm -hmm. else were non-actors and the, the method in which he recreated his childhood, you know, finding the furniture from his childhood and, mm -hmm. and creating this tapestry, this rich, you know, production designs. I just feel like it's, it's a masterpiece. And it's so, I, I, you know, there's hypnotic, transporting, enthralling. I just, um, if it doesn't win Best Picture, I will, I will be crying for days. Well, <laughs> well here, okay, so here's the thing. So when we saw the film at Telluride, it had screened the day before and it screened, I think, in Venice right before Telluride. Right. And we'd and already the, been hearing We'd already a been lot. hearing just within like a day or two. 
uh, that the buzz was already out there about this, how this movie was a masterpiece. So when I was watching the film first time, I've seen it twice, I was like you. It, it only it took me more than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I felt like the first hour was a bit so I, 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 slow. Um, but then there's a magic to the film because suddenly what happens is you spend this first hour just getting familiar with the characters, mm -hmm. getting familiar getting with the dynamic them. of the mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So that when, when the, the dynamic changes, when the stakes within the family uh, change and are raised, uh, there's a, uh, an incredible scene in the movie that is unforgettable. I don't want to say what it is. Yeah, do you know, no but, spoilers here. <laughs> no spoilers, but I, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. But when things like that happen, you realize how invested you how, were. Yeah. Uh, how vested you were because yeah. of that first hour where yes. you're just sort of getting the feel for yeah. it. Yeah, like that very first scene that's very slow with just the water on the, you know, you're kind of going, what? what's going on? Yeah. You have to let go of your sort of preconceptions of pacing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it is a movie that you have to commit yourself to. It casts a spell. It does. It is engrossing and it is absorbing. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I agree with you, uh, Alfonso Cuaron, he's kind of like Christopher Nolan for me in a sense that he's always makes really good or he, great movies. He never Not has one. taken a full step. He yeah. doesn't make that many movies, but he takes his time and makes fantastic movies. Yeah. But when you look at it, 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 it's a return to form for him to the sense that E2 Mama Tambien was a very, very personal film. Right. You know, then, I mean, he made the very best Harry Potter movie, Prisoner yes, of Yes, he did. It is the very best. That was the best, best one. Yeah. And then yeah. Children of Men was, for me, one of the, my, it was my favorite movie of the of the aughts, of the O's. Wow. Uh, it was a, a Blade Runner for the 21st century. Yeah, it was and amazing. Gravity, yeah. Um, you know, I was really rooting for Gravity to win uh, Best Picture yeah, for 2013. So he won Best Director, though. He won Best yeah. Director. Which could happen this year where it will divide. I yeah, mean, you yeah, know. That could happen. The meticulousness with which he directed. I can't imagine, you know, it, to me, obviously I think it's the Best Picture, but Best Director, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I but mean. But his performance, okay? Yes. Yeah, non-actor. And I was trying to think back the last time I saw a, 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 a just a, a breakthrough, breakout, a completely uh, mind-blowing performance by someone who had never acted who before. Who was it? And I was thinking back to Catalina Sandina Moreno. Oh, yes. From Maria Full of Grace. Oh, I love yeah. that. Yes. And, and that movie. Uh, but she was, was actually an actor. She just hadn't acted before, whereas this woman was never trained as an actor. Right, right. Yeah. But she's she is phenomenal she's in this so movie. She's so wonderful. And, you know, there's so much to the film that in, in some ways, like the favorite, that you need to see it a few times. Mm -hmm. Well, there's you know, the whole backdrop of like the student protests that were going on yeah. in Mexico City. And, which were horrible and brutal, and you know a lot of us don't even know about that. So there's this whole it's it's putting in this in a socio political context, and also the sort of class. You know, she's a part of the family, and yet she's not. And there's so there's so much nuance and so much layering in this film that you can you know kind of take apart uh, as you're afterwards. It's one of those things that as you're watching it, you're just becoming enveloped, but then afterwards you start to you realize how much there is to yeah, it. Yeah, I, I love that also that it's just it's a it's a movie about family and the complexities yes. of family, the complexities of keeping a family together while while starting a family and building a family and how do, you know how does that happen and how do you do it and and I just there's so much to it um that is is brilliant and I think that Al, how Alfonso Cuarón how he goes from sort of this in, in incredible big screen experience in outer space with gravity yeah. to uh, an equally as incredible big screen experience That's so interesting. Intimate. But that's yeah. so intimate. Yeah. And, and it's intimate, but but Eric and Claudia, it is still challenging in its own ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, there's no score. Right. There's no musical. But score the sound the design is amazing. The sound design is amazing. The cinematography is amazing. Yes. I mean, obviously. It's and he black did and white. his own cinematography. I always used Chivo, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. obviously he learned a lot from him because the cinematography is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Not just even in the in the the beautifully composed scenes with people, but some of those vistas look like paintings. Oh, absolutely, and also so gorgeous. Also, just like with with Gravity and, and definitely Children of Men, there are scenes that are long takes. Very long. He loves doing that. He loves yeah. doing that. And yeah. you know what? There's just an authenticity and an organic uh, way that the movie engrosses you because of those long takes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I think this is a masterpiece film as well. And again, this is a movie that had to grow on me a little bit. And that's totally fine, if, you know, if you, if, especially because this is such a unique experience unto itself. You know, maybe you need to see it a couple times. But you really need to see it everything. on a big screen. Yes, you do. Yeah. As yes, much as do. I'm very happy that Netflix is giving it the push it is and Netflix is, a, you know, they obviously they believe in him. All that is 
is wonderful, but I'm worried that people are going to just see it. On, I've, you know, when I talk to people, a lot of people haven't heard about it because mm-hmm. it hasn't reached that level yet. And people say, oh, it's on Netflix. I'll catch it then. No, you have to see, see it on, it on yes. the screen. Because I feel like if, if you watch this on Netflix in your living room, you know, you're pausing it 20 minutes in. Yeah. It's a little slow and you're yeah. getting up and going yeah, to the bathroom. Yeah, no, it doesn't and work. And you're going to lose it. You're losing the yeah. effect of it slowly washing over yes. you and taking yes. over you. And I think you, that's That why. really needs to be on yeah. a big screen. Absolutely. Guys, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I mean, listen, I love... I love Netflix. 90% of what I watch is yeah, on Netflix. it's great. Um, I don't even have it's cable anymore. It's changed our anymore. lives. Yeah. <laughs> but here's a film that, that, that has to be seen on the big Absolutely. screen. Absolutely. For the first time. If you, if you wanted to see it, I, I've seen it always on a big screen, but mm-hmm. you know, if you had to see it a second or third time, sure, go for Netflix. Yeah. But... I really hope that people go see it in the theaters. And bring tissues. You're gonna you, yes. you're, you're, you're gonna be a bit a bit messed yes. up. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. definitely bring tissues. Yeah. This is a this is a uh, a make or break year for Netflix. Yes. Because you know they have a lot of contenders that they're pushing for Best Picture. Like Mudbound never quite made it. Right. As good as it was. But you got this is July. Ma- yes. You got this. Yes. Private um, Life, even some right. of the smaller ones. Exactly. Yeah. But you know this is a film that. Listen, if people watch it on Netflix, great. If you can see it on the big screen, even better. And yes, it's uh, it's going to be. Uh, I would say it's the front runner for foreign film. Oh, and oh, yeah. I would say for for director. That's the other thing Clara. I worry about. It'll win foreign film and won't win best picture. I just want to win best picture because yeah, it is the best, best picture. picture. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it. I, I would be perfectly happy if it did. There's another film that I really does hope win best picture. I'll get to that. Yes, we're we'll getting to that second, one. Yes. That, what's your letter grade, Eric? Oh, A. An A. An A. Yeah. A plus, 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 plus. A. Yes, it's an A. It's an <laughs> More A. More than an yes. A. A plus. So, yes, Roma. <laughs> this is a film that absolutely, if you're able to see this movie in theaters, if it's playing in your city, do it. Do it. See Roma. Support it in theaters. And then, you know what? Catch it again on Netflix or watch it for the first time on Netflix. Don't let this movie pass you by. This is a movie that absolutely needs to be seen. However, you can see it, but definitely do try to see it on the big screen. Moving right along to a movie we already reviewed. I want to talk about it again and get your take on this. This movie is Green Book, directed by Peter Farrelly. Cast is Viggo Mortensen, Mahershala Ali, based on the true friendship that develops between an Italian-American bouncer driver and the African-American classical pianist. He is to drive across the Deep South in 1962. This movie just won the top prize at the National Board of Review. Mm -hmm. And just to backtrack for a second, Roma did win Best Picture and Best Director from the New York Film Critics. Got to give props to that. But... Um, okay, Claudia, what did you think of Green Book? <laughs> You're not going to like it. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought it was shallow and glib and formulaic, and the performances were good. I love Mahershala Ali. I love Viggo Mortensen. I felt it was cliched. I felt it indulged in the whole white savior concept. I, I, to me, it's just a really middle-of-the-road movie. It's, no pun intended. <laughs> yes, it is a road <laughs> movie. It's a middle of the road movie. Um, I, it just did not work for me. I feel I understand that some people see it as a feel good movie. I feel I feel good when I see something that challenges me or that feels like it's pushing something further. I feel like this is a look. I love that that it's looking at racism and to some degree homophobia. I, the way in which it looks at it almost felt slightly offensive, but it certainly felt cliched and predictable to me. So I'm not a fan. Wow, okay, Eric Davis. <laughs> I watched the trailer for this and I was like, ah, it looks a little weird. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I actually walked out of a movie at TIFF, uh, at Toronto Film Festival, and I, I went into this one and I was like, okay, I'll whatever. Oh, I wanna know I, what you walked out I, of. I, I got, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's coming out in November, I'm gonna have to see it anyway. Uh, and you know, it start, and it started off kind of very simple, but but I, and then it kind of took over and I, I really liked it. I yeah. thought it's a simple crowd pleaser. Mm-hmm. Reminds me of films like, uh, uh, like the King's Speech, like something that's just very accessible, uh, and and th- the sort of film that I feel like uh, ten years ago would have been the lock for best picture. Sure. I think uh, um, yeah. we I think our times are a bit more uh, complex now, and I think people are expecting films that have these kinds of themes uh, to be a bit deeper. That's um, that's the issue. Than, than this, this film yeah. is. I think, like I said, I think this film uh, ten years ago is 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 perfect for people, but now uh, maybe it's not. But that being said, I am a kid who grew up. Up in the outer boroughs, uh, there are a lot of people who are like, Viggo Mortensen is too cartoony, is he's too over the top with his accent, and I'm like, you do not know people from New York City. 
he is from the. I, he, I grew up in Staten Island. I grew up around Italians, and and every nine out of ten guys were exactly like. Well, Viggo I met Mortensen. Nick Vallelonga, who's the screenwriter, who's the son of that character, and he talks that's just it. like him. Yeah, and he sounds just like him. him. Yeah, these, yeah. These, yeah. these are New York guys. These are guys that say you're breaking my balls. Like, <laughs> that's what they say. And this is that was real. And you know, I I do like sort of uh, unconventional buddy relationships, and I think that that's in there. I think the two of them have really great chemistry, uh, and I think there are some really fun scenes between them. Um, I am a New York guy. I think this is a New York story, and so I do sort of favor it in that way, too. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't dislike the film. I don't think um, I loved it as much as something like Roma, which just kind of transformed me. Yeah, um, but yeah. it is simple and accessible uh, and a crowd pleaser, and I think a lot of audiences will like that about uh, it. I would say, of the three of us, I like Green Book the most. It kind of, we each present a different outlook. That's mm -hmm. interesting. And and having said that, I agree with your points. I see your points about about the simplicity of it, the the white the white savior, the uh, um, the simplicity of it. But here's the thing: I felt like the simplicity of Green Book was its charm. It is a refreshingly straightforward movie. No bells, whistles. Uh, no long takes. No fancy camera techniques. It is a straightforward movie, and yes, it's very broad, it's very accessible, uh, yes, it's formulaic to an extent, but the, the brilliance, and I do say the brilliance of this movie, I think is the way it balances heart, humor, and depth, like, and, and it makes it look easy to do. It makes it like, it looks like it was an easy film to make, and movies are not easy to make by any stretch of the imagination. And, and I just like, I was won over by the film. I, had, I didn't know anything about it mm -hmm. when I saw it. And uh, it, like, it was a big, fat, huge surprise. I've now seen it three times. No question that Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali are terrific together. Individually, their performances are great, but they complement each other, they elevate each other, and Mahershala Ali, who already won an Oscar for Supporting Actor for Moonlight, so good. I feel like this is a much more fully realized character that shows his range even more than Moonlight, and I feel like that puts him at the top of my list to once again win the Oscar for Supporting Actor. Well, he, he was on the screen a whole lot more than he ever was in Moonlight, so mm -hmm. what he did in Moonlight was pretty amazing considering he was barely in the movie. Right. Um, but I totally, I see what you're saying, and I think they're, they're Act, their performances are excellent. There's no question about that. Um, I have more of a problem with the writing and some of the, you know, like the fried chicken scene. I mean, uh, there's just certain things like that. I just found myself cringing. And yes, there were moments that I laughed. There were moments that I found, you know, enjoyable. But overall, I just, I, I found it like we we need something deeper when it, and, and I realize this is about this particular era. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the concept is great. I mean, I love the idea of a road trip and then the whole idea that, you know, here is this guy helping him navigate the South with all its Jim Crow, you know, problems and all of that. I just wish it had been written with a little bit more depth. That's where. That's, that's, yeah, that's what I would say. I think. I think in terms of depth, I think we're sort of just above kiddie pool depth. We're not in the deep end. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. You know, yeah. we're not, we're not taking yeah. swan dives yeah. here. Yes. We're, we're kind of walking around. And, yeah. And, but you know, I, I do like how it is sort of this story about these guys from completely different worlds uh, getting to know each other, getting to understand each other, and coming to love each other. And I think that is a really nice thing about it. I do think that when they are in the deep south. I did like how every situation that they came across where racism was in play was different from the one before it. And so they weren't just kind of running over the same exact situation over and over again. That you, We get it. They're all racist down there. Uh, they were all different. They were all kind of drove the story forward. So I like that about it. But I do think that it did need a little bit more yeah, depth. Yeah, the other thing uh, about Green Book is this. So, so the other two films we talked about, so you have the favorite, the favorite, which is a challenging film. And you have Roma, which is a, which is a, which is a ceiling breaker, and it is a unique film. And, and it's, it's an emotionally any, challenging film, too. It, it, it takes is, a while. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But now here's a film, Green Book, which it's not, I would not say it's emotionally challenging. No. It's right there. Where is it's harder on its sleeve? Yes. That's okay. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Like, I'm, I actually, there's something about this film. Yeah, I call it a feel-good crowd pleaser. I like feel-good crowd pleasers. Uh, I did not feel like I was being manipulated. I did not feel like my buttons were being pushed. I hate when that happens. See, I kind of did. Like, for instance, okay, I'm not. This is hopefully yeah, not a huge yeah. spoiler, but um, Viggo Mortensen 
tells him about the joys of eating fried chicken. Yeah. And then he tells him about the joys of black music. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, button one, button two. Come on. There, there, there is definitely, <laughs> uh, I do feel like they, they, they elevate each other and they help each other. I think one person helps the other more than the other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I feel like it's not, it's not like a 50-50 It's not equal. Balance. That's where the white savior part comes right, in. Yeah. Right. And I, and I see that. I understand it. But at the same time, there was so much that I, I really embraced about it. And I, I feel like I, I actually did really like the screenplay. I like the dialogue. And I've seen it three times now. Uh, three times in like a month and a half. And <laughs> it's a movie that if I still had cable, because I cut the cord, but if I was flipping through, you know, and I came across Green Book, no matter how far into it it was, I would keep it on. Yeah. And here's the other thing too. Unexpected, but in the end, Green Book is a Christmas movie. Think about it. Oh, oh it no, is. very much yeah, is. Yeah, it is. Christmas mm-hmm. there. Yeah. And it's not being sold that way. I mean, you know, they, they talk about Christmas and, you know, It may whatever. be one of those movies over the years where people, you know, like Love Actually or different other ones right. where people use see them as Christmas movies when they weren't necessarily intended as yeah. that. Yeah, okay, just, just don't, Actually. just don't, I am from New York and we do eat a lot of pizza. I would not recommend <laughs> oh. taking an entire pie of pizza and oh. folding it. Yeah. Uh, take it one piece at a time yeah, and enjoy it. Yeah, the movie made me hungry. All right, I hate to ask, but what is your letter grade? <laughs> C. C. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, Eric. I give it a B plus. I give it an A. I just love this movie. So the average I, I, I see the I see the criticism. I respect yeah. the points of view. Uh, William Bibiani was on the last time talking about it. He brought up the same exact points. Um, so it is definitely something that is felt by by many. But I feel like this is a film that, look, if it does, if it, you know, the fact that it's bringing up those kind of conversations is... Is worthy. Is, yeah. is what makes this movie timely and relevant. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, like, so. I look at the movie like The Blind Side, which mm-hmm. I, I, that was much worse in many ways, and it was much more of a white savior. And that, you know, that one I will, I would never encourage people to see. This one I would say, see it, draw right. your own conclusions. Right, Okay, that's, yeah. a, that's a fair point. And, yeah. and you know, talk about Love Actually, like that was a movie that I felt like did push my buttons. Oh yeah, yeah. So Manipula- one, I don't like being manipulated. Yeah, I yeah. don't like being manipulated yeah. here. But, Let's move on to a very, very interesting <laughs> film called At Eternity's Gate, directed by Julian Schnabel, starring Willem Dafoe, Rupert Friend, and Oscar Isaac. It's an intimate and poetic portrait of painter Vincent van Gogh while he lived in France. Eric, what did you think of At Eternity's Gate? You know, I respect this movie a lot. It's an artist movie. It's an artist about an artist, made by an artist. Uh, it's, I think, in some ways for artists. It's shot the way an artist would shoot. I think it's sort of uh, I think Willem Dafoe is fantastic in it. Uh, I think it's a speci- it's a very different Vincent Van Gogh movie that we've ever seen. Uh, it's totally not accessible. Yeah. Uh, there are, <laughs> there are, uh, in, in terms of the kinds inaccessible. of inaccessible. Yeah, I think this is a very inaccessible movie. I think you have to be prepared for very long scenes of Willem Dafoe just trying to like hike through mountains and into the grasses and, and paint and sit there and just mm-hmm. frantically paint and and you know but it's and it's shot from a, a painter. It's shot by an artist. Yeah. Who's very much trying to sort of, with the way he shoots it, convey the way an artist thinks and yeah. the way an artist kind of feels. And so I really respect that about it. That being said, I just, it, they were, it didn't do anything for me. I okay. didn't, I kind of watched it and I said, I respect this movie. I like the way it's shot. I like this performance. I like this take on Van Gogh. But there's just nothing. It's not penetrating me emotionally. It's not hitting me in a spot that says, you know what? I'm going to go and watch this another seven times. I got to tell all my friends to watch this because I just don't. I don't. I don't, th- I don't think it's the movie where you're bringing all your friends over and you say, let's throw on Out Eternity's Gate. Let's get into some Van Gogh right now. True. It's not that kind of Van Gogh picture. But I think if you are an artist and you really appreciate movies that are told uh, from an artist's pr- perspective, um, I think this is a film that you should check out. I but agree. It, um, I maybe liked it a jot more, but I but I generally agree with all your points. I thought it was very impressionistic, mm-hmm. how appropriate. Um, and I love that it was he used natural lighting, mm-hmm. so you felt like you were you know immersed in that time. Um, and I I because it's you know Julian Schnabel who is an artist as you point out, you know the idea that you're kind of getting into the mind of an artist I found fascinating, mm-hmm. um, and seeing things from his perspective and, and getting also his sort of tortured psyche which we all know you know a lot about. But there were, I love. 
that some of the scenes looked like you literally you saw the paintings come to life. Mm -hmm. So visually, yes. Um, was I occasionally a little bored at times? Yes. Um, but I loved the score too. I thought yeah. it was really beautiful and lilting and um, it's not something I would watch over and over again. Um, but I did like that he tried to get into his creative mind. I thought it had some poignance and tenderness. Um, it was really beautiful. Yeah, you know, here's the thing. So, I mean, I agree with both of you. I think I liked it as much as you did, maybe a little more than you. But again, not a movie. I'd be like, hey, you know, hey guys, let's watch, let's watch. <laughs> let's <laughs> get, <laughs> throw it on. Um, let's, let's, get, let's get crazy and watch tonight. Yeah. Julian Schnabel. I mean, he, he is an artist. Uh, uh, you know, in every sense of the word. I mean, uh, I loved the Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Yes. I thought that was a beautiful film. Yes, it was. You know, this movie. What I appreciated about it, first and foremost, obviously, is uh, is Willem Dafoe's amazing performance, and he. Amazing. Looks so much like him. He, mm -hmm. even he though does. he is technically oh, he older, really does. I mean, yeah. where's that hat? My that God, that does yeah. look like yeah. Vincent Van Gogh, at least from the paintings that you've seen of and him. And Oscar but, Isaac as Gauguin and uh -huh. some of the other Rupert Friend. I mean, I thought the performances overall and some of the scenes that you just felt like you've been transported back into that time. It's it's avant garde. It's impressionistic. It does feel uh, abstract, like like a painting. Uh, and I, I'm sure that was absolutely his point was to make a movie that was very much like that. A it's not a formulaic life. biopic at all, just covering this one part of his life towards the end. And uh, it's a movie that I admired more than I actually liked. Yes, the same okay. absolutely. I admired it. Yeah. I mm -hmm. thought it was. It's a like looking film. at a beautiful masterpiece. It yeah. maybe doesn't move you that much, but you can acknowledge that it was. The brush strokes are amazing. But but the you know the merit itself is is Willem Dafoe's tour de force performance. Yes, and he's been just doing such great work lately. Obviously oh, yes. last year in the Florida, Florida Project. Project. Yeah, uh, Witcher Letter Great Arc. He deserves an Oscar. Uh, I would give it a B minus. Uh, that being said, you know what? It's the kind of film where, uh, like I said, it's an artist movie. You know, you smoke a joint, and maybe you, uh, <laughs> okay. you maybe you sink into this film and, and, a, and a, on a whole nother level, and wow, it turns right. into a party, buddy. It turns into a hay for you. But for me, At when I watch it, at least didn't play uh, Don McLean's. I'm, look, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be completely honest. It's that kind of film. I think that you want to be in a certain headspace for it, and an artist's headspace for it, and I think you'll like it a lot more. For me, I wasn't in that headspace when I watched it. But I give it a <laughs> But maybe the Need next time, joint. but maybe the yeah. next time, my friends are coming over and we're getting. <laughs> Crazy with some big guys. Go. Let's watch Abby turn this gate. All right, you're what a great uh, B. B. Yeah, B. B for me too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, listen. Uh, uh, whatever the headspace is, it, it's a it's a movie that has its merits. It's a beautiful film. Yes, definitely not going to uh, uh, you know make a hundred million dollars its no. opening weekend. But uh, I think it's a movie that that does stand on its own merits. Very good film. Let's move on to a movie that is now streaming on Netflix. Uh, that's where all the big stars go these days, including <laughs> the Coen Brothers. Uh, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, directed by Ethan Coen and Joel Coen. The cast is Tim Blake Nelson, Tom Waits, Liam Neeson. Zoe Kazan, this is an anthology of six stories about life in the Old West. Claudia, what do you think? This feels like the cinematic equivalent of a concept album. You know, it's just, right? Wow, that should be on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> or the Blu-ray. <laughs> um, it, it, so because of that, some of the stories are better than others. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big Coen Brothers fan, and I feel like it's at, at its best, it has some of the moments that, of the best Coen Brothers movies, mm -hmm. like No Country for Old Men or Fargo. And then other times it kind of drags on a little bit but it has that that sort of strange skewed vision like the very first one with Tim Blake Nelson where he's this singing cowboy and he's all you know you think he's just a good old boy and it turns out he's this ruthless killer oops that was a spoiler no no it's okay okay yeah, I, mean, I think, <laughs> I think people could figure yeah, that yeah, out yeah. we're not saying how it happens <laughs> um, but you know so that was kind of fun to watch the evolution of that character um, there's another one with James Franco didn't think worked quite as well I, there was uh, one of the vignettes with um, um, Zoe Kazan, I thought was really good. Yeah, yeah. And then the final one, uh, you know, it's it's really about performances. I felt like these performances were great, and also the sort of you know dark wit and dark humor and dark vision that the Coens have. So I found it very enjoyable. Um, with the caveat that some of the segments are better than, than others. I, I completely agree. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I, I love the film. Love the film. I think if you're somebody who you've never watched a Coen Brothers movie before and you're like, you know what, I want to watch one Coen Brothers movie and sort of understand all of the different kinds of movies they've made, mm. I would say watch uh, this one. I think it's, uh, I, I can't believe it's on Netflix, uh, but I yeah. did get to watch it on the big screen and I'm thankful for it because it is a gorgeously so shot beautiful. movie. Yeah. Uh, and 
yeah, I think all of the different segments uh, are different, and I think they're all sort of about uh, men of particular crafts, and and uh, which I found interesting about it. And uh, I think that they're all um, different in their own ways. But I do understand. I do agree. I, I like some more than others. I love the Tom Waits one. I did too. Yes. I, I yeah, think that. that um, yeah. I think yeah. in in uh, I feel like Tom Waits is somebody who should be more in the awards conversation, but because of this film, because it's Netflix, because of the way it's structured, I feel like that's not happening. He but could be he a is, supporting actor nominee. He is. Fa- I mean, he does he's it all fantastic. Yeah, yeah, he does. He, he looks like support. Ned Beatty now in his old age. You know, he. Yeah. You know, I that? thought he looked like a Bruce Dern. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, sometimes like lately <laughs> in, in later years, I kind of get the two of them confused. <laughs> yeah, if you put but the yeah. two of them. Yeah, well, I, 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 I agree with you. Uh, I, I loved this film, and I think that's a good point, Eric. That if you want to get an idea for all of the different tones and styles and moods yeah. that the Coen brothers have brought to the fore over the last 30 mm. plus years. It's, it's all right there. It's a much faster thing there. than watching like four of their movies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, something, some vignettes work better than others. Uh, I did like the Tom Waits one the best uh, because here's the thing about the film. I watched it at home mm. on Netflix. Me too. On my big TV, but no big TV is a match for the big screen. Now, here's a film, like watching the scene, the, the vignette with Tim Blake Nelson, watching the scene with uh, James Franco, watching the scene, especially with Tom Waits, and you're looking at the beautiful plains, big sky country, the mountains, the rivers, and I'm watching this movie on Netflix thinking, damn, I wish I saw this on the big screen. Because one of the things that this movie does very effectively is that it shows the beauty and the violence of the old west yes, it captures in equal that. measure at the same time yes. that they could be just as beautiful and deadly yes. at the same which time. Which is a really interesting thing to capture. Many movies have done it at different times, but to kind of capture that that quintessential mm-hmm. what the West was is yeah. really they, yeah. and they can do it. And I, and I I love the I love just the way the Coen brothers torture all of their main characters. <laughs> yeah. It's my favorite <laughs> It's my favorite quality about them. Uh, they they do they just torture the hell out of every one of their main characters in in very fun and unique and, and inventive ways. And and I got to see this on the big screen. And one of the things that I took from it was not only did it look gorgeous, but you know the audience all applauded after the Tom Waits uh, oh, yeah, sequence. Yes. And so that's the other of, thing watching it with yeah, with and people. you're hearing the yeah. laughter and you're feeling you know I think just to feel this movie with an audience is very important. To feel Roma with an audience is very important. Mm-hmm. And so I agree. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, I look, I love I love Netflix. I love what they're doing. I yeah. love how they're sort of uh, funding uh, some of some of our great filmmakers of our day and yes. letting them do what they want to do with Absolutely. that money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That being said, th- be they're creating yeah. movies that you want to feel with with a collective group. Of and, and listen, let's to, to be honest. You know, the other thing that I love about Netflix is that all six, all six Star Trek shows, <laughs> including the animated series are on Netflix. That is like 737 hours of Star Trek right there at your remote. So there's that. There's so but much at your fingertips. I digress because everyone knows I'm a massive Well, speaking tracker. of digressing, how did you guys see At Eternity's, Eternity's Gate? I'm curious about that. Did you oh, watch I saw it? it in the theater. I oh. did not see it in the I theater. I did not see it in the theater either. Yeah. yeah. I saw it at the Landmark. And I, I you know, I mean, it's, it's like I think it'd be m- much more beautiful you know, It's a beautiful the film. Yeah. So, so that's a that's Like a Green Book is an example. You could see it any place. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think most of the movie, th- at least those three that we've been talking about. But, you know, like, when I think of the Coen brothers screen. and I think of, of movies like, uh, uh, let's, I love Inside Lumen Davis. That's my oh, that's one of my favorites. That's one of my absolute favorite movies. A movie that it didn't get as much love and attention as it should have. Oscar Isaac should have been nominated for that, mm-hmm. but he wasn't. That's in my top five. And mm-hmm. like the vignette with James Franco, like I really thought captured sort of the dark, ironic humor of the Coen brothers, the best of these vignettes. But the Tom Waits one, where he's looking for gold uh, by himself for the most part, is really uh, is really just a tour de force mm-hmm. and, and the best vignette of the film. What's your letter grade, Claudia? Uh, B plus. Yeah, B plus for me. Right. I give it an A. Give it an A. Nice. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Love yeah, it. No, listen, I think this is a great film, and I think it's something that, that it's on Netflix now. It's on Netflix now. So while I have you, make sure, uh, before we finish up with our last film, just make sure that you hit us up on Twitter. Let us know what, what you think of the movies that we've been talking about. Agree, disagree. It's Collider Video, hashtag Movie Review Talk. Hit me up on Twitter at Movie Mance. Make sure you comment below. Let us know what you think of the movies we talked about. Let us know what you think of the panel. 
be nice. Moving on to the last film. This is going to be interesting. It's Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle, directed by Andy Serkis. Uh, cast is Rohan Chan, the voices of Christian Bale, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Batch, Cumberbatch. <laughs> <laughs> His girlfriend might be called that. Obviously, no, yeah, yeah. yeah and the cover patch and uh, Kate Blanchett. Uh, the plot for Laura Kipling's Jungle Book is given a whole new spin, or is it Eric Davis? Ah, oh, Andy Circus. Yeah. You know, this is a film that uh, visually it's impressive. I love how it takes uh, it, it shows you a different kind of version of the Jungle Book story. I think it gets a lot more into sort of the human aspect as well, which uh, the the animated version, the John Favreau version, does not. That being said, you walk out of this movie, and even if you do like all of that about it, your first two questions are why. Why does this exist? Yes. And who is this for? You know, I don't understand how you can make a, a, an adaptation of the Jungle Book that's not for kids. It should not be seen by no, children. It's it way not. too violent. It should mm -hmm. not be seen by yeah. children. And I think the effects are incredible. I think, like John Favreau, Andy Serkis is very much this creative who's sort of at the forefront of motion capture technology. And I kind of wanted to see him take all of that and put it into something else and not this. To see two. Jungle Book movies by these two brilliant men who are very much pioneers in this technology is a waste in my opinion. Uh, Agree um, 100%. But I but do yeah. think that it is uh, wonderful the way it is visually and I think that if you are a fan of this story uh, this is a different take on it and it doesn't have all the music of the Disney version and I think it's a little bit darker and complex so if you're an adult I would say watch it uh, but it is not for kids. Claudia. I would say don't even watch it if you're an adult. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I thought the last one, the Favreau version, was much better. Um, one of the problems I had with it, was, in addition to everything you just said, I, why, um, was the actual, like the, the computer-generated animal or, you know, the... the performance capture, they looked like sort of worn, stuffed animals. They didn't look in any way realistic, mm -hmm. and the fur looked a little matted in not a way that would be realistic. It just reminded me, I just kept being conscious all the time that this was there was nothing real about this. I didn't feel immersed into this world. Um, I thought, you know, the actor who played Mowgli was fine, but I thought the actor who played Mowgli in the last one was better. There was that, whole, then there was this kind of disjointed feeling where they, he spends, he goes off into this little village, and he's with Frida Pinto, and, and she's very wonderful, but it's it just felt like that was a different movie, and yeah. they kind of like shoehorned them together, and it didn't work. And I just kept wondering why, why yeah. we don't need this movie. I would love to see, like you, Andy Circus take his many, many talents and, and on you know and and put them toward something that is original and inventive. I actually did like that a little bit about it, though, that it did kind of show you um, the difference between sort of and and what what how he stuck between these two worlds, right. Um, and it and, was trying to do that, yeah, it was yeah. trying to do that. And so I appreciated that for it. But then when they get to that that human kind of village, it, it really gets dark and violent. Oh, yeah, and that's when I'm just like, who is this for? Exactly. Andy, what are you doing exactly. here? Exactly, yeah. Uh, so here's the thing. I agree with both of your points. First of all, Andy Serkis is a trailblazer. Like his work over the, since 2001, starting with the first Lord of the Rings, mm. then going into the three Apes all movies, three yes. Brilliant. Absolutely. All three of those Planet of the Apes movies yes. are brilliant. Mm -hmm. There's not a dud in the bunch. That Planet of the Apes trilogy is one of the greatest trilogies in movie yep, history because they were And all he so humanized mm -hmm. Caesar. Right, absolutely yeah, he did. Yeah. And that's a great arc to go yeah. from over the course of those three movies, from birth to death, mm -hmm. in a trilogy. I mean, what, whether you're doing it from performance, motion capture, or just as an actor, whatever, I mean, and he did do it as an actor, it's a great arc for a character. And then he directs that movie Breathe with uh, Andrew Garfield, and then he, uh, he's, uh, he's in Black Panther, and he's, uh, he's uh, you know, he's in the, the Hobbit trilogy. So he's very, very versatile. He's clearly learned from the greats, whether it's Rupert uh, 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 Wyatt or uh, Matt Reeves or especially Peter Jackson. Sure. But going into this film, for half of the movie, I felt like, okay, we just had the Disney version. This movie, while darker, while more mature, while more violent, it's still not different enough from the Disney version. And then the movie breaks out of the jungle and it turns, it takes a turn 
that I was not expecting. That's when the movie got good. But that was such a short period of time. But I agree with you. And it was at the end. <laughs> but it was not what I expected. Yeah. I did not know it was going to go there. Yeah. And I went from watching a movie, you know, in my chair, in the theater, comfortable, just watching a film, being like, okay, it's not, that di it's not different enough to warrant being made. Mm -hmm. But it still has its merits as a well-made film. It is effective. Uh, it's too dark for kids. I agree with you. It's too dark for kids. But I still thought it was a very mature coming-of-age film, a different version of, the, of Jungle Book, that, or, you know, different enough, but not necessary until the last part of the film. And I sat up and went, this just got really, really good. And it won me over. And in the end, in the end, I did like it, and I do recommend it. I see the points that you made completely. I agree with them. At the same time, I also see that on its own terms, taking the other versions of Jungle Book away, the fact that we just had one very, very recently from Disney that was a big, fat, massive hit, this movie on its own merits has many merits to recommend it, and it does get better as it goes along. It's a well-made film, uh, and, and I, 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 th I thought it was actually, in the end, very good. God, who's, sitting, who's sitting around that table and they're like, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> the Jungle Book, but not for kids. <laughs> and we'll get a kid to star in it and we're just going to make all the money. I got to say, Animals. you are a funny guy. I just, you know what? It, it just, I, I joke, but I, I wish. Well, it, it has been kicking around since the other Jungle it, Book. Yeah, I think so, that actually Andy started doing yes, this one before, before Favreau's. John, yeah. yeah, but it's um, like, listen, you have competing asteroid movies, you have competing volcano movies. Uh, yes, you know, but you're Right, happens. but not for kids. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't make. And I, ju I just, I, I get to know music, but not for kids. If Andy's, yeah. if Andy's going to put all of that talent into a film, I'd, I'd much rather see something that's different. That's yeah, different. something innovative, something different. It's original and yeah. innovative. Yeah, yeah, we've seen this story forward. so many times. It's just. Done. So to Andy Serkis, if he's watching this, please do not make The Lion King, but not for kids. Uh, Eric, you're funny. This, I'm trying. Eric is a funny guy. I'm trying. I love this. Which one would agree? Oh, I would give it, I would give it probably a, a C. Caught it. C minus. C minus. I give it a B. I mean, I liked it. I mean, the, like, like for the way I feel overall about film, you know, if you're watching a movie and you like it and then you lose interest, like it's too long, the pacing drags, it keeps going and going and going, or, or whatever, it loses its steam. That's one thing. But if a movie is not really doing it for you, but then, then you warm up to it and it wins you over and it ends strong. For example, Bohemian Rhapsody. The first hour of the film, I thought that movie was a very, you know, effective and entertaining, but very formulaic, cliched rock biopic a Wikipedia version of Freddie Mercury and Queen. But the second hour of that film was really where it hit its stride and it ended very, very strong to the point where I walked out of the film, I was so pumped, I was so pumped. Same thing with Star Wars Rogue One. Uh, first hour was fine, second hour was amazing and it ended great. This movie, Jungle Book, uh, Jungle Book, see? Uh, Mowgli, it ended very, very strong, it won me over and that that's I think a hard that's thing unusual. to do. It is a hard thing to do because I, I always think, you know, movies can start out good and go worse, go, yeah. go downhill, but it's unusual for a film to start, you know, eh, and then get better. Right. right. I, I agree because I do walk out sometimes of films that end very strongly and I'm like, this was great, you know, yeah. But then, like a half hour later, I'm like, okay, that kind of masked the fact that the rest of the movie was not as good. And so, yes, strong ending, but still a lot of a movie that isn't as strong. Well, my letter grade is a B, and it is on Netflix, so check that out too. But definitely check out Ballad of Buster Scruggs first. So, a lot okay. of Netflix this week. A lot week. of Netflix. Netflixes. Yeah. And then again, just in addition to these movies, you got six Star Trek shows. So <laughs> go crazy. And the original series is in high definition and it looks amazing. Okay, Eric, where can people find you on Twitter, Instagram? Uh, yeah, uh, MySpace. the best place to follow me is on Twitter at Eric with a K Davis uh, for all of my latest and greatest. And of course, Fandango. If you know, if you go to the movies this weekend, plug, plug, buy your tickets. So Fandango. that's actually Eric Davis, not spelled out Eric with a K Davis. It's right. E-R-I-K-D-A-V-I-S. <laughs> yes, you never know. <laughs> At E-R-I-K-D-A-V-I-S. Uh, follow me. Watching a lot of movies right now with a lot of opinions. Uh, Mary Poppins Returns being the latest one. So, uh, so yeah. Okay, Claudia? Twitter at Claudia Puig. That's easy. Uh, Instagram, I think there's some dashes. Claudia underscore Puig underscore. Because there's another one. 
But. Well, make sure you follow all of us. And make sure you follow me on Twitter at Movie Mance. Make sure you follow Collider Video. Make sure you hashtag Movie Review Talk. Again, please share the YouTube version of this. Share it with your friends. Like it. Make sure you comment below. Please share it, retweet it, and tell your movie friends to retweet it. This is the most fun, the most entertaining, the most, the most uh, enthusiastic movie review show ever okay and yes i'm biased by saying that but i really do love doing this i love having guest critics on you know friends that i love and respect every week and to make sure if you're listening on a podcast make sure you share that version too and next week next week on movie review talk we got movies from natalie portman margot robbie and saoirse ronan and julia roberts is back until then here's looking at you kid Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.